thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. Happy to be here at this stage in Mumbai. Completely unhappy to be in between yourself and the lunch, of course. I'll be as quick as possible, but not less than 20 minutes. So prepare yourself. I'm sure we're going to have interesting conversation, interesting presentation, interesting discussion. I just need to grab a clicker for that. Thank you. And my presentation today is about the data strategy. Surprisingly, right? Um, and I would like to start that with the famous quotation of Charles Darwin, who once said that that's not the strongest and not the smartest species that survives, but the one that is most adaptable to change. Why I decided to start with this quote? We may agree or disagree with Mr. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. However, that works perfectly in the business, uh, in the business content. In the beginning of this century, I joined the company that some of you probably still know, the company named Nokia in Finland. And I was managing the global Nokia data integration platform there. It was the richest company. They hired the smartest people. What happened to Nokia just in 10 years? The new generation even doesn't know this name. The old people still remember, there was no question, what phone you have? We ask which Nokia you have. And I think that this is very important to remember when we speak about the data, data strategy, and data evolution. And to explain that, I need to have a couple of steps back into the history. When we started to manage the data, when the people like Rolf Kimball and Bill Inman came up with these frameworks for data warehousing, the idea was very simple, the idea of data gravity. Get all your data you can get hold of. Move them to a single physical place. Your data set will start growing bigger, attracting the smaller data sets, growing bigger, bigger, and bigger. And everybody started building data warehouse. A single place specifically built for reporting, analytics, that was the first step on our data gravity journey. After some time, we started to realize that not all the data fits in well into the relational structure. And everybody started talking about the big data, about Hadoop, about data lakes. The technology has changed, has evolved. However, the approach of data gravity never changed. Grab all your data as much as you can, move them physically into a single monolithic data lake, sit on top of that, and then everyone is happy. What we can witness right now, that the same story is going to the cloud. We can hear a lot of, okay, now you want to get all your data into a single cloud, and then you're gonna solve all your issues with the data. <laughs> The monolithic architecture, definitely we, I built my first data warehouse in 2002. This framework, this approach, it worked very well to the certain type of data in the certain time in the history. It still works for the given use cases. However, the monolithic approach has its downsides. On average, a company has a 10 to 12 copies of the same data. That's what we are doing when we are creating the monolithic architecture for our data. We keep copying, 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 copying data many times, even inside of data warehouse. You have a staging area, then you read it, you copy that to the core data warehouse model, the same data, just differently, you know, st uh, structured and maybe cleansed. You take the data again, you move that to the data marts, same data, same copy, many data marts. Same story about data lake. You dump the data into a landing zone, then you move that to the trusted zone, curated zone, business zone, you name it. You're creating a multiply copies of the same data. And that's not only bad in terms of the footprint. It's also bad because your data is prone to be unsecure in this case. Your data are only secure as the least secured copy of your data. 
and also you are running into the risk of data being inconsistent. But that's not the, not the biggest problem. The reality right now is that the data gravity notion, data gravity law, doesn't really work anymore. Our data is everywhere. Every single company has at the minimum a data warehouse and analytical data lake sitting side by side. You can have a several data warehouses in the organization, several data lakes for different departments. Some data is moving to the cloud, some data will inevitably stay on-prem because of this or that reason, security. You know. We are facing the multi-cloud architecture. Some data is in Google, some data is in Azure. Data is everywhere. They are naturally distributed, distributed in terms of the technologies, in terms of the geographies, in terms of the ownership. And business, by the way, doesn't really care how you store the data and manage them. Business has a very simple question. Give me my data. Where is my data? For the last 25 years, we've been fighting with data silos. Every single conference that we spoke about data, there was 100% one presentation saying, okay, how to break the data silos, meaning the data silo in the applications. What we've managed to do in this last 25 years, we've built the data silos, but bigger. Now the data is siloed in the different technologies, the traditional relational databases, the, the traditional data warehouse, new analytical platforms based on Hadoop. We have the whole spectrum of new technologies that we collectively call NoSQL which can be whatever, like a graph database, time series database, document store, key value pair in memory. There are a lot of technologies in, in that space. You can still have some data not integrated to either system in the applications. Data in the cloud, data on-prem coming in streaming modes, static data, structured, unstructured. This leads us to the, the term of data diversity. If you look at that, really you can see that the types of the data that we have to deal with is growing exponentially. If in the beginning of the like 70s we only had to deal with the common separated files, then the relational databases came to the picture. Then we could see really a rise of those different technologies that addressing a narrow data use case and now we have this kind of picture. And the problem with the distributed data landscape is that you still need all your data in the same place to run your reporting, to do your analytics, to do the machine learning and artificial intelligence, to execute the projects, data monetization, data democratization, open data. You still need all your data in the same place, but your data is scattered across the universe. Those are the three major data anti-gravity forces that we could identify. That is the technology. Data is naturally sitting in different technologies. Relational data should not be stored in the analytical data lake. Graph data should not be squeezed into relational, and so on. Another one is the geography. Data is naturally distributed geographically. You can have the several data centers in your company. You can have the global companies that have all the data all over the world. And you can have the data in different cloud data centers, and it doesn't make any sense to move them physically into a single place to manage them. Data distributed in terms of ownership as well. I'll give you a simple example. We worked with one customer, a small low-cost airline, and they had a flight going from Dubai to Beijing. And they were asking us, how do we, where do we store the customer data? What do you recommend? And they wanted to build a monolithic centralized place for that. However, Dubai law says that the data about the citizens of United Arab Emirates must stay inside of the UAE borders. Chinese law says the same about the Chinese people and their customers both. So where to store the data? Data is distributed because 
of the ownership of the data. It says that a government puts the ownership or given department and the organization doesn't want the data to leave the, the framework. And as the solution for that, our company, Dinodo, we're coming up with a completely different approach to data management. This approach is becoming more and more popular among the data professionals, and this is the foundation for the modern data architectures like logical data fabric and data mesh. So how does data virtualization work? Instead of getting all the data into a single place, what do we do? Whenever the query hits our platform, we are reaching out to the, uh, all underlying data sources, grabbing only the data that is needed to answer the particular query from the business. And same business, I mean, again, all those initiatives starting from simple reporting or analytical, predictive, prescriptive analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, algorithms training, uh, data monetization. That's how data virtualization works. We look at the data from the business perspective. We don't collect all possible data into a single place. We allow the data to stay in a distributed manner. However, providing at the same time all the possibility to manage data, to integrate the data, to cleanse the data, to apply all the security mechanisms right on fly on this distributed landscape. And I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of those modern data architectures that are <clears throat> becoming really very popular right now. Imagine the simple situation. You have a data lake in your company and you have a data warehouse. Both work well. But business needs the report on the analytics to be done on the both. Some people start moving data from data lake to data warehouse or vice versa. We call that misintegration. To address this kind of the technological data distribution, we have the framework of this, that's called logical data fabric. Your data sit, stay where it is. We don't move data physically. However, we build the abstraction layer on top of the data that allows us to decouple the consumption and the data sources, allow data to be in their native environment, don't move them anymore. That's the idea of the logical data fabric. Integrate them logically without building yet another huge super monolithic data repository. That's not an option anymore. And then you can run whatever queries you can do, whatever uh, operations on the data sets that you allow to do before with the traditional architectures. However, this approach allows you to achieve almost real-time reflection of the data for the business consumer and minimize the data replication. Another popular uh, framework that is on the top of the mind of the many professionals now globally is the data mesh. We, work closely with the company who basically invented this architecture with this lady, Jean-Marc Degeny, who's the author of the idea. So the idea of data mesh is again to keep the data distributed. However, it looks to the data distribution more from the ownership perspective. If the data is produced by the financial department, the ownership should stay with financial department. If data is produced by marketing team, the data ownership should stay with the marketing team. All, only they know the best, what is the good quality of the data, how data should look like. However, they, sh they should share the data in a unified, abstracted manner with the rest of the organization, providing this uh, data mesh, naturally. Binding the data together to provide the universal layer of data as a product for the rest of the organization or even for the other companies. We saw this architecture uh, works very well when we speak to the government institutions, especially the people like from the statistics authorities and the people who are responsible for open data in the country. The ministries, they have data, but they don't want to share that. They don't want to lose the ownership. They can share, but they don't allow you to move. The data mesh concept works very well in this perspective. So I just want to finalize this session with our motto. We should stop collecting the data and start connecting them. 
then by the way, we will get rid of the question which data we should collect. But don't collect data if you don't need that. And I would like to thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you appreciated that and didn't get that hungry that you killed myself. Thank you.